Well, I want to thank everyone for being here today for our last book sandwich then this year for 2021. And I want to thank you, Joyce, for presenting today. And Joyce will pre be presenting on Cassie St. Clair's The Golden Thread, How Fabric Changed History. Joyce is a part of the Ontario County Art Council. And I will turn it over to her for today's presentation. Okay. And I want to do my screen share in just a second. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Joyce Kova, um, and I am a member of the Ontario County Arts Council. I am not a fiber, fiber or fabric artist, um, so this book was really very interesting to me um, to make me think about things that I had never really thought about, and, and uh, it had a lot of good, fascinating information. So the Ontario County Arts Council and the His Ontario County Historical Society are sponsoring many events this year and next year. Um, and this book talk marks the kickoff of what we're calling a celebration of fibers and fabrics. At the end of the book talk, I'll tell you more about upcoming events and give you the Ontario County Arts Council website so you can get more information on future fiber events and programs. A copy of this book is available through the library. So if you enjoy the book talk today and you want to read the whole book and, and have more than just a sampling of what we're doing, of uh, what um, is being discussed today, um, you can get it at the library. And there's also a few copies that will be available, if they're not already, at the Ontario County Historical Society that you can check out. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. So I'd like to start with a quote from Cassia St. Clair. And she says, after all, we have, we have after all been spinning fibers into threads for well over 30,000 years, then weaving, knitting, and knotting those threads into all manner of marvelous objects. I hope to give you a sampling of the fantastic and, and um, fascinating research and stories that Cassia St. Clair includes in her book. Her entertaining and very readable writing style makes learning the history of fibers and all the marvelous objects a really motivating read. She includes many, many stories, some of which we will touch on today. As we go along, I'm going to be posting accompanying photos. Uh, the links to these photos are available on the Ontario County website, Arts Council website. Um, and I, again, I'll give you that link at the end. Uh, pairing the links to, of the photos to the stories in the book really makes the book come alive. So I hope you'll take advantage of them if you do pick up the book and start reading it. Miss St. Clair asserts that fabrics and fibers have had an enormous impact on cultures and economics worldwide. At the most basic level, she tells us that fabric and its component parts have long been a figurative stand-in for the very stuff of human life. So think of hanging by a thread or being part of the social fabric or being torn away from family and friends. Language and fabric are also interconnected. So we get text from textile or fabricate from fabric. We even get spinster, meaning a single woman. One of the focuses in the book is how clothing and fabrics are often used to define people and delineate their social status. Currently, we have uniforms, work clothes, weekend clothes, and if you're like me, pandemic clothes. So throughout history, different cloths, different colors, different patterns were all significant in defining groups of people. So why was the ability to make fabrics and fibers so important? Oops, I'm going to go back. Wait a minute. There. Um, some examples Ms. St. Clair gives are that creating ropes and nets enabled people to gather food and carry objects. Making sales created a means to spread ideas, goods, and languages. 
producing clothing provided a way to explore unfriendly climates <clears throat> on earth and in space and to enhance abilities in sports. Bookkeeping and money were developed to deal with the trading and exchange of goods and wealth could be accumulated. Um, Ms. St. Clair gives the Italian Renaissance as an example of how accumulated wealth gathered through the exchange of fabrics and other goods could be spent on arts and invention. And lastly, she suggests that the first technology was making fiber and that that led to all sorts of inventions. She suggests that inventions related to weaving were one of the earliest forms of technology. She gives the Jacquard loom of 1801 as an example. This was the first loom that was programmed to mass produce complex and different patterns in fabrics. And this was accomplished by a series of holes punched in a series of cards for each pattern. This, she feels, could have been the precursor to the IBM computer system. Kind of an interesting thought. Most often, Ms. St. Clair tells us, weaving, sewing, and knitting are portrayed as women's work. This was true in many legends and fables. Remember Rumpelstiltskin spinning straw into gold? Or Penelope, who was Odysseus's wife in the Odyssey. St. Clair reminds us that Penelope remained faithful to her husband while he was gone on his Odyssey by spending three years pretending to weave a burial shroud for her father-in-law. She said she would pick a suitor when she was finished. Odysseus returned before she was finished because every night she tore out what she had woven that day. Although seen as women's work, working with fabrics gave women a means by which to express themselves as well as financial security in many cases. It provided a means by which to keep the women themselves and their families out of poverty. It helped their families to pay taxes. It provided families with goods for trading. And for many women, it became or was a means of expression and also a way to record history. The Bayou Tapestry is one fascinating example of women's expression that Cassia St. Clair tells about that also recorded history. It was created by women around the 11th century. On it is recorded the history of the Norman victory over their own countrymen. There are 53 scenes on the 230 foot long, 20 inch high fabric. Another example is poet Sue Hui's palindrome poem that was created for her husband. He had been exiled, but swore he would always remember her. She stitched this poem on shuttle woven silk brocade in the fourth century AD. It contains 841 characters, which can be read a total of 2,848 different ways, forward, backwards, horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. And even the outermost square characters create a circular poem that can be read. Another example she gives is the fabric work of abstract artist Sonia Delaney. She, she um, worked in fabrics and textiles and co-founded the Orphism modern art movement. Orphism is when color is added to cubism. So her work impacted fashion, home decorating, and furniture. And another favorite of mine, and a more current example of self-expression, is author and artist Faith Ringgold, who created stories on quilts. Her work can be seen in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Guggenheim Museums. She uses her quilts as inspiration and illustrations in her children's books, one of which is Tar Beach, which you see here. I used her books when I was working in the Rochester City School District as they were both multicultural and the children loved looking at the illustrations and talking about them. Now we will follow as Miss St. Clair takes us into fabrics, fabrics history. She tells us the earliest traces of fibers were found in the Zudzuana cave in the Caucasus Mountains in the Republic of Georgia. Radiocarbon dating dates the fibers back 34,500 years. These fibers were made from flax. 
St. Clair tells us that over a thousand microscopic fibers were discovered on the cave floor. Some were twisted and some were spun, which indicates generations of fiber workers. They were also dyed from plant colors, mostly gray, black, turquoise, but also yellow, blue-violet, khaki green, and pink. Most of the earliest fibers discovered around the world were made from flax, which is harder to extract and work with than wool, St. Clair tells us. And she hypothesizes that the fibers were probably first made into strings or ropes to carry goods or food. She also tells us that we learn about fiber works and their dates from the tools and technologies left behind, rather than the fibers themselves, as the fibers often disintegrate. We know whirlwind whirl weights were used because the looms were depicted in pottery 4,000 years old, and warp weight looms were identified by the weights themselves as they were only the only part of the loom that survived. Eyed needles were discovered in a Siberian cave and were used by the extinct humans called the Denisovans. And she says that the oldest eyed needle found dates back 35,000 years. So when did man first begin to weave? The oldest evidence was found in Notovastanis in the Czech Republic. They found the imprint of woven fibers and clay fragments dating back 28,000 years. Moving forward in time, Miss St. Clair discusses mummies. We know that mummies such as King Tut were wrapped in linens. But the linens themselves, when, when discovered by explorers, were often not valued and were torn off. However, the ancient Egyptians viewed the linens as magical. St. Clair instructs us that great quantities of linens were used in the mummification process and that the shape of the wrapped body was associated in Egyptian art with divinity. King Tut, for example, was wrapped in 16 layers within three coffins and one stone sarcophagus. Ancient Egyptians also wrapped sacred objects and linens to put in the tombs. St. Clair recounts the story of Senebtizi, a woman who was mummified around the end of the 12th dynasty. She was found in a tomb in the pyramid Licht. Her heart had been removed, stuffed with linens, and replaced in her body. According to the author, mummy unwrapping was a popular activity in the early 1800s. Augustus Bazi Grand Granville in 1825 wrote his essay on Egyptian mummies after publicly unwrapping a mummy given to him. He writes, quote, I recollect with pleasure the sensation which the demonstration of the various parts of the mummy at the time it was first opened excited amongst upward of a hundred scientific and literary characters who in the course of six weeks honored me with their presence at my house to witness the dissection." Unquote. Granville approached the unwrapping and, and dissection scientifically, but others such as Thomas Pettigrew became famous for his theatrical mummy unwrappings. In one instance, he removed a 400 yard long piece of linen that took over two hours to unwrap from the mummy and it sent the spectators into a frenzy. While the Egyptians used linens, silk was used in ancient China. Because silk degrades and leaves very little behind, St. Clair says the exact origin is difficult to pinpoint. However, her research showed that the oldest silk proteins were found in tombs around 8,500 years old. This painting, Court Ladies Preparing Newly Woven Silk, belongs to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It was rendered by Emperor Huizong in 1082 to 1135. And I'm gonna read from the book now on page um, 63. St. Clair um, describes it as follows. Painted with ink, pigments, and gold on a long scroll of silk, it shows three groups of women all engaged in various stages of processing textiles. In the far right, four women pound the silk. In the center, two ladies sit and sew on a jade green rug. To the left, another group stretch out a length of fabric. 
They are likely imperial concubines, then amongst, among the most elite women in Chinese society. They are attired in a pattern empire-waisted gowns in harmonious colors, cerulean, greens, apricot, and pinkish reds, with their hairs teased into elaborate shapes and held in place with combs. To the uninitiated, the scene is about as decorous as could be imagined. But as it happens, all three of the steps in silk processing shown are also tropes in, ero in erotic poetry. Pounding of cloth, for example, was often used as a euphemism for a woman's desire. The emperor, using a silken canvas, was implying that these glamorous silk-clad women were working out their frustrated longing for him by making yet more silk. China was the only place where the B. Mori silkworms produced silk for 5,000 years. Miss St. Clair describes the B. Mori caterpillars as difficult to raise, as they are voracious eaters who eat only mulberry leaves. She instructs us that 12,000 caterpillars eat 20 sacks of mulberry leaves a day, and that a single pound of silk requires 220 pounds of leaves. The leaves must be clean, dry, and not too hot, or, the, or they will kill the caterpillar that eats them. A harvested cocoon is immersed in boiling water, which kills the silkworm chrysalis, and this frees the silk filaments from the tightly woven cocoon, and then they can be reeled, twisted, and dyed. So the Silk Road was the reason that China's monopoly on silk making ended. The Silk Road provided the means by which camels, furs, wax, honey, precious stones, and other animals could be traded. However, silk from China was the most highly sought after. Along with the goods traded, whoops, let me go back. Along with the goods traded, Miss St. Clair instructs that ideas, religions, fashion, and illnesses were also traded. Cities along the routes thrived. One such city was Danhua in northwest China near the Gobi Desert. The story Cassandra St. Clair tells is that near Danhua in the Mogao Cave Shrines was one of the greatest archaeological finds of the 1900s. Wang Yu and Lu, a Taoist monk, guarded the shrines. One day, he discovered an artificial wall inside one of the shrines, and inside this hidden room were found bundled manuscripts from floor to ceiling covering 500 cubic feet. There were documents in 17 different languages, many of which are not, no longer used. Uh, also, the oldest known print book was found, one of Buddhist sermons, and many, many works of art in silk and textiles. Also, a wooden panel was discovered that had painted on it the legend of how China's silk making secrets were stolen from China. Another way customs and goods were traded or taken was by the Vikings. Ms. St. Clair devotes a chapter telling how they developed longboats and ships that sailed. These boats were essential to the Vikings. Their ships were used in funerals, funeral pyres, attacks on far-reaching lands, and trade. They were able to cover vast distances. Miss St. Clair tells us that there is evidence that the Vikings reached North America 500 years before Columbus. For Vikings, she tells us, waterways became their roadways and sails lent these ships their power and their reach. Sails were made from wool for the Vikings. While this sounds absurd to us, the Viking sails were created from sheep that resemble today's old Norse sheep. These sheep are wilder, smaller, and hardier than domesticated sheep. Their fleece has two layers, a soft under wool layer and a wiry outer layer. Their fleece has a high lanolin content, which makes it water repellent. St. Clair instructs us that it takes 10 minutes for four to five people to rue a sheep. So instead of shearing, the tufts are pulled by hand, and that's called rueing, which helps keep the lanolin content, and it needs, the wool needs less um, combing. Women completed the work in the winter, soaking the fibers in oil, spinning and weaving the wiry outer fibers into strong yarns 
that became the waterproof warp and the underwool was softer and was used as the weft. Ms. St. Clair informs us it would take two and a half years labor for a woman to make a 90 meter square silk or square sail, whereas long boats themselves took about two weeks for the men to build. Um, on page 113, the author explains how much the Vikings relied on woolens. It is odd, bearing in mind the angular fierceness of the Viking image, to remember how crucial soft woolen yarns were to their way of life. Without them, in fact, Vikings would have been quite different. Ships and sailor warriors may have been the ones romanticized and celebrated in poetry to this day, but woolen cloth and those who made it underpined their success. Well into the 20th century, Norwegian seamen headed out for three months sailing and they would take three changes of underwear, a shirt, five pairs of sea mittens, two pairs of ordinary mittens, a similar number of leggings and stockings, mostly made using a kind of crochet or single needle knitting technique known as nail binding. All of these garments were traditionally made of wool and needed frequent darning and replenishing especially lucky sailors, those who could afford it, might also have a look luxuriantly thick sailor's blanket, each of which demanded the wool of 17 sheep. In another story, we learn that the Trondines Church, a medieval church in Northern Norway, was renovated in the autumn of 1989. While working on the roof, the repairmen found scraps of cloth stuffed in the gaps between the masonry. They thought it to be leather as the cloth was so dirty and stiff. However, it was discovered it was actually wadmal, a coarse woolen cloth that was once a sail on a Norse ship. The Normans or Norse Vikings conquered Britain in 1066. After settling there, St. Clair tells us, they began reorganizing how, woman, how wool was farmed. Wool played a crucial role in England's prosperity. Farming, handling, generating products, and trading them created major occupations for many. St. Clair describes the wool trade as the, quote, engine of England's finances. It created wealth, widened the gap between the have and have-nots, and gave Britain a foothold on wider European affairs. Then there was lace and the social distinctions that it created. I am reading from page 137. A girl looks down at the work between her hands, utterly absorbed. She's seated in a spare pale room, so bereft of detail that it's difficult to say whether it is a room at all or a void hollowed out by her singular focus. Her dress is a glowing lemon yellow shade. Her hair is gathered away from her face in a quaff of plates and large ringlets. Our eyes follow hers down between her fingers to the V formed by a pair of bobbins she is using to create a piece of lace. The girl, we do not know her name, was painted by Johannes Vermeer toward the end of his career. The lace maker can be interpreted as a meditation on craft, creativity, and the human capacity to spin beauty out of the humblest materials. White linen lace, after all, originates from humble seeds sown in the earth. Conversely, however, it is also one of the best examples of a de decorative luxury fabric it serves no function other than advertising the status, taste, and wealth of its wearer. It provides no warmth and is exceptionally delicate, liable to snag and tear, leaving a careless wearer disgracefully tattered. And yet during this period, European society, men and women alike, were consumed with the desire for this frippery to the point where its lack would elicit comment. As a result of its popularity and the price it could command, it provided so much prestige and employment that diplomatic relations between countries could be strained by the ebb and flow of production and consumption. 
Ms. St. Clair further explains on page 143 that lace was always a luxury deployed to display wealth, taste, and rank. Its value as a signifier of social status lay in its delicacy, its manufacture, and its expense. So potent was it as a status symbol that wearing it was regulated by law to prevent commoners from using it to masquerade as their social betters. One English proclamation passed in 1579 forbade ruffs made or wrought out of England to be worn under the degree of baron's son, a knight, and a gentleman in ordinary office attending upon Her Majesty's person. In Venice, the population of the Jewish ghetto were forbidden to wear white needle lace, gold and silver laces, or any bobbin laces wider than the breadth of four fingers. In America, there was another more extreme example of class distinction, and it came with the slave and cotton trade of the 18th century. The author informs us, quote, cotton, one of the cornerstones of the Atlantic slave trade, was simultaneously a medium through which identities were crafted and asserted, unquote. If you read the reward notice, it tells of escaped slave Emily, who took several items of clothing with her when she escaped. This could be because she only had clothes made from what was referred to as Negro cloth that would give away her status in a free state. Or perhaps she took the clothes to be sold for cash to help in her escape. Clothing, the author states, was, quote, specified in over three quarters of the runaway advertisements and was fundamental and, and was the most popular thing to take with them over seemingly more fundamental items such as tools, weapons, money, or even food. Overall, the slaves' clothing endorsed their status. St. Clair tells us that Negro cloth could be made from wool, but was usually made from cotton into a plain, coarse, durable woven fabric, most commonly in colors of brown, blue, or white. As cotton became the fabric of the West, many new inventions helped with the processing and production of, cloth, of cotton into cloth, such as Eli Whitney's cotton gin or the spinning ginning. As production of fabrics increased, so did the need for more cotton and more slaves. Even after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, St. Clair instructs, the cotton industry continued to grow. Plantations were building their own mills, creating their own cloth, and selling it for less money than the imported cloth from England. Today, cotton remains one of the United States' biggest industries. And who can think of cotton without thinking about Levi Strauss and blue jeans? The author provides this story to illustrate how denim had become a cultural revolution. I'm reading on page 175. She says, the city of Elko, Nevada held their fourth annual Silver State Stampede Rodeo on June 30th, 1951. It was a boisterous affair. The breeze carried competing scents of sugar, hot oil, horse sweat, and bravado. In the crowds, women in heeled sandals and cotton dresses linked arms with khaki-clad servicemen. Small boys in college shirts and turned up Levi's boogled the bucking cowboys they hoped they would one day emulate. When it came time for speeches, Bing Crosby, the singer, actor, and guest of honor, strode through the crowd, get, grasping a pipe between his teeth and wearing a broad smile and an even broader cowboy hat and an extraordinary jacket made from indigo dyed cotton. The jacket was brand new and so stiff that Bing had to wrestle one handed with the buttons as he walked. It was too warm to wear closed. Although he wore it with pride, its creation had been precipitated by a social humiliation. On a recent hunting trip to Canada, Crosby had been asked to leave a Vancouver hotel by a desk clerk because of his casual attire. He had been wearing Levi's waist overalls, or as we would call them today, jeans. Luckily, he had finally been recognized by a bellhop whilst being firmly escorted off the premises. The brand, hearing of the incident and ever mindful of a marketing opportunity, made the singer a playful take on a tuxedo jacket with thick pale lapels, 
a corsage fashioned from their trademark red tabs and copper rivets, and a tongue-in-cheek label inside that read, Notice to hotel men everywhere. This lab label entitles the wearer to be duly received and registered with cordial hospitality at any time and under any conditions presented to Bing Crosby. Clothing impacted how and where we could adventure, according to St. Clair. Mountaineers Andrew Levine on the left and George Mallory on the right died on Mount Everest in an attempt to reach its summit in 1924. Their bodies were finally found in 1999 and were identified by their clothing, which was made of natural fabrics and fibers, and by their hobnailed boots. They wore Burberry jackets and several light layers underneath. The layers would, of course, keep them warm when they were moving, but not when they stopped. It was surmised that Mallory's better judgment was affected by the desire to reach the top that final climbing day when a storm blew in as they neared the summit. St. Clair tells us of other innovative clothing, down puffy coats, synthetic down, and finally Gore-Tex, which addressed the issue of being both waterproof and breathable. The author also devotes another chapter to synthetic fibers, which were first developed in the late 1800s by scientists determined to transform cellulose into a fiber they called imitation silk. The most common method involved the use of fine wood pulp and many caustic chemicals. Factories sprang up over Europe and the United States and the American company DuPont focused on rayon and built its first rayon factory in Buffalo in 1920. Focusing on women's nylon stockings as the hems rose in the 1930s was brilliant of DuPont. However, the physical and environmental cost of the chemicals and the deforestation continues to this day. Agnes Humbert, a middle-aged woman working as an art historian in a Paris museum, was actually part of a resistance group. St. Clair tells us Agnes and others from her group were arrested by the Gestapo in April 1941. She was tried and found guilty in a military court and was sentenced to work in a German rayon factory for the remainder of World War II. St. Clair uses excerpts from Agnes's books, book, Resistance, in which she details her experiences working day to day with the caustic chemicals that produce rayon and the toll it took on herself and others. As well as outfitting explorers to be able to endure inhospitable conditions, fabric impacted our destiny in air and space travel. Without proper clothing, mankind simply could not travel the upper atmosphere and beyond. We don't think about it as we board an airplane or as we watched Neil Armstrong work, walk on the moon, but fibers help make such experiences possible. In this fascinating chapter, the author provides a history of special suits that were created and tested as people strove to master the air. As Earth's atmosphere was conquered, space became the next frontier. The race to get into space required special clothing to sustain the astronauts, both in the space capsule and on the moon. While many companies vied for the privilege of making the astronauts attire, the final victor was the international latex company known today as Playtex. This was a small company at the time of about 50 employees who made latex moldings for bras and girdles. St. Clair describes the growing pains the scientists from NASA and the seamstresses from the international latex company had to go through to create the A7L Omega spacesuit. And I am going to read from page 234. Despite NASA's objections, the making of what was to become known as the A7L Omega suit, A for Apollo, seven because it was the seventh in a series, and L for ILC, was much more akin to making girdles than anyone at the space agency would have cared to admit. Each suit was fashioned in, by hand on a sewing fl 
floor populated entirely by women, seamstresses, pattern cutters, and makers using adapted Singer sewing machines, standard pattern templates, and the skills both inherent and honed from years of making women's underwear. Those who had been trained to mold liquid latex to create girdles and bras found themselves making pressure bladders instead. Eleanor Forker, Foraker, an experienced seamstress, was pulled from Playtex's diaper assembly line in 1964 to work on the Apollo project. The Omega spacesuits inherited other things from the firm's main line of work, too. The nylon trico, a kind of knit mesh embedded in the rubber to prevent it from ballooning, was the same sheer fabric used to make many Playtex bras. Each spacesuit contained a layer of fluffy girdle liner after complaints were made about the discomfort caused by the rubber chafing, chafing against the skin. The exactitude required in making the spacesuits, however, was beyond anything the makers had encountered before. Pins, for example, usually a staple in any seamstress's kit, were strictly rationed and even forbidden. In 1967, after a rogue pin was found between the layers of a suit prototype, an x-ray machine was installed on the sewing room floor to scan each layer of fabric produced. Sewing machines were modified to only fire one stitch at a time so that the seamstresses could in ensure the seams of these multi-layered garments were precisely straight. To meet NASA's exacting standards, seams could deviate no more than 1 64th of an inch. Handling the latex and, glue and gluing the layers together also required previously unheard of skill levels of skill. Only three or four of Playtex's employees, for example, were considered sufficiently deft to fashion the paper-thin layers of latex to make the suit's internal bladder. What made all this so much harder was the number of layers and components involved, each of which had to line up precisely with all its fellows. In the end, each Omega suit worn to the moon was comprised of some 4,000 pieces of fabric and 21 distinct layers of material. From swimming suits to footwear, St. Clair recounts how the use of innovative fabrics and materials have helped athletes in setting new records. However, ethical questions surrounding just how far the use of these materials and new technologies should go are debated by competitive sports governing bodies. One such governing body, FINA, I, I think pronounced FINA, tried to outlaw the new polyurethane-based swimsuits for their 2009 FINA World Championship. At the competition, Michael Phelps lost to German Paul Biedermann, who was wearing a polyurethane suit. Phelps was quoted afterwards as saying, quote, it's changed the sport entire and completely. Now it's not swimming, unquote. And footwear is another area where its evolution has helped different types of athletes. But back to silk, because silk fibers can also come from spiders. St. Clair gives us the golden orb spider, a native of Madagascar, which produces golden colored threads. These large and incredible web weavers create webs up to two yards across. Although spider silk is similar to that made by silkworms, she tells us the spider silk is superior and that it produces a softer, lighter, stronger, and more elastic silk. Because the silk produced by these spiders is remarkable, inventors try to divide, devise ways to get more silk from spiders. One such invention, silks, spiders. If you Google, Silking Spiders YouTube, you'll see a video of a spider being silked. It is said that the spiders are not hurt in this process, that they are gathered from the wild, silked, and returned to their homes without any detrimental effects. Here is a close-up of the golden spider silk cape that St. Clair describes in the book. Its threads are the product of more than one million female golden orb weaver spiders and that this is the actual color of the silk, nothing was dyed. 
These reels contain synthetic spider silk fibers from the spider silk proteins produced by goats. The, this option involves splicing genes of spiders into the genetic makeup of goats and extracting the silk proteins in goat milk to create silk. It has been used according to the author, but is a process with many hurdles to overcome and hasn't been very productive. There is another much rarer type of silk cloth known as sea silk, which comes from a clam. Harvest, harvesting and spinning the sea silk is a skill handed down from mother to daughter. Miss St. Clair introduces us to Kiara Vigo, who is thought to be the only person left alive who knows how to harvest sea silk, spin it, and make it shine like gold. The author concludes, quote, the majority of people today will never see, let alone wear sea, sea silk or a cloth of gold. They won't cross seas powered by woolen sails, learn how to make silk, or learn how to make lace or milk goats genetically modified to produce spider silk. And yet textiles of all kinds are intrinsic to our lives and cultures. And she says, cloth gave humanity the ability to choose their own destiny. So that was an overview of some of the incredibly and thoroughly researched stories in the Golden Thread. As I said, I'm not a fiber or fabric artist, so I hadn't thought about much about a fabric's impact on humanity. So I just found this fascinating. And I really enjoyed how Cassia St. Clair wrote in such an approachable way and pulled together so much information to make this book fascinating and enjoyable to read. And I've got a couple of other books up here that are also related that you might also enjoy. So there's the pocket and memories of survival and threads of life. And so our next event, and here's the OCAC website, Ontario County Arts Council website, um, that you can go to and you can see what events we're doing and how this um, celebration of fibers and fabrics is going to, um, going to the events it's going to, to have. Um, our next event, which we are doing right now, is creating pandemic banners. And it's open to people of all ages. Um, you can visit local libraries or the Ontario County Historical Society to pick up a six by six piece of felt. And on this piece of felt, you're going to, with this piece of felt, you're going to create your own banner. Um, you're, you're going to use fabric and a word or two to describe what the pandemic means to you. So if you go pick up a piece of felt, or maybe you have another six by six piece of felt at home that you can use, um, you can also get the instructions where you get the felt. The banners will be displayed in the local libraries. And we're planning um, a clothing upcycling event in June. And other workshops next year include a coral reef created from fabrics, a fashion show, and various workshops like basket weaving and felting. So if you go to our website, the information will be posted. And Alexis, that's it. I've got to go back to stop share. Yes. I've, I've lost my cursor. I'm trying to find it where to go. Oop. Uh, Can you stop the share? I can. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, um, they can direct them in the chat. Or if you wanted to verbally ask questions, please feel free to use the raise hand option. And I can allow you the ability to um, talk. I hope everyone enjoyed this. It was a lot of information, but it's a really interesting book. Um, so Anne says, um, thank you for the book review. It was great. Charlene says, very enjoyable. And Anne um, says that you did a wonderful job. Um, they said, thank you so much. It was fabulous and that they love fibers. 
Uh, well, I recommend reading the book because I just touched the tip of the iceberg with all the information that's in it. And I, I really hope people go to the Ontario County website and, and become involved in some of the uh, programming that's going to happen over the next year or so. Um, we've got a lot planned and it's going to be really, really interesting. Um, Anne says that she's looking forward to checking out the website and thank you for the information. Um, Elizabeth says, thank you. Good job that she enjoyed it and she has already reserved the book. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take my copy of the book too and drop it off at the Historical Society. So. And it looks like Judy um, would like to say something. I'm going to unmute. Joyce, great. Thank I you, had a hard, I had a hard time getting on, but it was wonderful. And the, and the images to go along with it really were so well done. Um, it just um, brought back my reading of the book. And I do encourage other people to read the other books. They're wonderful. Um, we keep coming up with the ideas because of those books. So it's great. So thanks. I'm, I'm glad you got that done. And we hope to do this again, maybe at the Historic Society when people can actually come. Right, right. And I have to thank Tina Blackwood because she did a lot of the uh, researching of the different photographs. I did some, but she did the majority. Yeah, they, they, they were superb, superb, just wonderful. And uh, at the library, thanks for helping me get back on. I missed the first part because it took me to um, Mother Goose, and I didn't really want to see that. So <laughs> I don't know what I did. It, I'm sure it was my fault, so it was okay. <laughs> well, very good. I, I bet you're glad this is done, and, and now you can relax. <laughs> but we'll have lots more projects, and I do encourage people to... Um, stop in. In fact, uh, this Thursday is our opening of the new exhibit called Fur, Feathers, and Fins. And people have got wonderful, wonderful animal things that are there. It's a fun exhibit, entirely different than other things that we've had in the past. So it's, it's fun. It's very fun. And that's at the Ontario County Historical Society. Yes. And it's going to be open from 10 to 430. I'm not taking a lunch break. So I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> um, any other uh, questions or comments that we have for Joyce? Well, I enjoyed doing this, Alexis, oh. I the opportunity. We enjoyed having you. Um, and I know I always ask if there's any other questions or comments, and I know it takes a few minutes after you actually post the question for people to actually write it in the chat. <laughs> right. Um, right. Does not look like we have any others. Um, so I want to thank everyone for attending and I want to thank you Joyce for being here today for our last book sandwich then um, and you did a wonderful job. Thank you.